Uh, thank you, Chairman uh, Carper, for calling this hearing today. And thank you, Assistant Administrator Fox, for being here to discuss, as the Chairman said, e EPA's efforts to address PFAS, including the new PFAS strategic roadmap that was just released earlier in the week. But before I turn to PFAS, I would like to take a moment to thank you uh, for all of the agency's efforts in helping us to deal with the lead issues that were discovered in Clarksburg, West Virginia. While there remain some process questions about how we got where we are, I appreciate EPA's close coordination with the state of West Virginia and the city of Clarksburg to ensure that the, cities, uh, the citizens of, of Clarksburg have safe drinking water. So thank you for that. As you know, addressing PFAS co uh, contamination is extremely important to me and has been one of my highest priorities at EPA or EPW ranking member. EPA has been working hard to understand and address PFAS for many years now and across multiple administrations. And I would note there is increased interest and increased awareness among our membership here in the Senate of the pervasiveness of PFAS and uh, in what forms. So while I applaud all the EPA for the progress, I think much work remains. Of utmost importance to me is that EPA expeditiously sets a drinking water standard for two specific PFOS, PFOS, P PFOS, and PFOA. This has been a longstanding pri priority of mine through the past administration, and this one we've talked about it on the phone, and I am pleased that the Biden administration has stated it will complete these standards in the roadmap under a process initiated by the Trump administration. I also appreciated that the White House and EPA specifically responded quickly to my seven February 17th uh, letter by lifting the Biden administration's freeze on promulgating those regulations. It's vital that Americans have safe drinking water, and these regulations will help to ensure that. And I look forward to hearing an update. I do have some issues with the roadmap because it touches on a whole host of EPA offices and statutory authorities, and often the details, particularly on timing within the document, are vague and several years down the line. The American people deserve to have the transparency into how EPA plans to address these regulatory matters, when and how the science will, will be to leading to those conclusions and outcomes. I look forward to hearing detailed updates on other potential regulatory actions and, PFOS's, um, <clears throat> and EPA's PFAS research activities in your office and others, which I know are necessary to form the basis of appropriate federal action. Back in April, I wrote to EPA requesting an update on the agency's research initiatives. I was a bit disappointed that EPA's reply did not really get into any, um, provide any of the specificity of the information that I had requested. As I had stated in my April letter, many of the regulatory and enforcement actions the federal government and states may pursue hinge on continued research. Quite simply, we need a more in-depth understanding of the chemistry and environmental and health challenges posed by this broad class of compounds. The roadmap, re released only on Monday, fails to describe what new research or technological breakthroughs are triggering or modifying EPA's approach to addressing PFAS. As EPA stated, quote, re robust research is a prerequisite to improving EPA's understanding of the risks associated with PFAS and helping the agency make more informed decisions to protect um, public health. I assure you, uh, Administrator Fox, that we are prepared to, uh, I hope that you are prepared to share the current status and, and current um, expected completion dates for EPA's incomplete research and regulatory efforts today and why, after a history of missed internal deadlines on this issue, keeping in mind that you probably weren't there when they were missed, we would expect something different. It is vital that EPA ensures that science and not politics is driving the regulatory decisions. My colleagues and I cannot determine that this is the case with this administration without improved transparency and the latest information from EPA dealing with what the agency knows what it does not know, and how progress is being made. I've helped ensure that EPA has the necessary authorities to fill any information gaps related to PFAS. PFAS legislation that I drafted, the PFAS Release Disclosure and Protection Act, was approved by this committee and ultimately signed into law in the NDAA fiscal year 2020. Some of these authorities are listed in the PFAS Strategic Roadmap. One of the reporting requirements in my legislation was that companies comply with a one-time reporting event for PFAS manufactured since January 1, 2011. EPA has proposed a rule to implement that requirement this summer, and I thank you for that. 
I hope the information that the agency will obtain from this reporting and others like TRI and TOSCA Section 8 will better inform the agency as it determines how to best address the challenges of PFAS contamination. As I believe we all know, and, and the chairman stated this as well, PFAS is present all over this country and all over the world with background levels of contamination from a multitude of sources. This is a very complex issue. But the actual threats to human health and the immediate environment can be or uh, highly localized. This is exactly why a deliberative science-based approach to testing and remediation is necessary. Lastly, um, with plenty of misinformation out there, appropriate risk communication from the federal government is critical. We talked about this on the phone for helping our constituents understand and address this PFAS uh, pollution. So I look forward to hearing updates on each of these important issues, and I thank you again for coming.